Good day, Donald. First of all, let me thank you for agreeing to do this video interview with me over Skype. For our audience, could you please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about where you grew up and where you went to school, what you did in college, etc.? Sure. Well, already within a few words, you would recognize that I have an, an accent. That accent is from Scotland, uh, where I grew up. I grew up in such small mining villages and, you know, working class Scotland. Nobody in my family went to college, that, that, that type of background. I, so this was Calvinist, the Calvinist world, really, you know, where it was frowned upon to enjoy yourself, you might say. But I ended up going to college, university, the University of Edinburgh, beautiful city. I lived there for many years. I originally, interestingly, I originally went to do science, but I changed at the end of my first year because I found it so deathly dull uh, that I changed radically into doing a degree in philosophy. Uh, and that's been my love ever since, to be honest, you know, my sort of core academic interest. Uh, uh, beyond that, I also studied in the States at the Ivy League uh, Dartmouth College. Uh, I was there for a while, uh, which actually hugely influenced me because that was my first encounter with technology. Uh, those colleges that had IBM on the campus with a big mainframe, Remember, this was before PCs, yes. before the internet. And I, I was doing a course in philosophical logic, actually, and they, they allowed any student on any discipline to do some programming. I was really quite enlightened in those days. And it was where AI, the big modern era of AI, artificial intelligence, uh, happened in 1956, which was the year of my birth, coincidentally. The year Elvis was launched that long ago. <laughs> so... It had a, turned out to be a very profound influence on my life, the AI bit. And I'll come to that a little bit later. Anyway, like most Scots and Irish people, you know, we're mostly diaspora. We mostly leave our countries because they're relatively poor. I ended up in London working on a film and video. And, and then I, met, I bumped into two guys. I had some experience on the, on the sort of coding side. And I met two guys who were running a business in Brighton, which is right in the south of England, below London. And I moved there. And we set up a business, uh, and it was a sort of video production business originally, but very quickly became a computer-based training business before the internet. Mm -hmm. And then, cut a long story short, we we were quite successful, floated on the stock market, raised a lot of money, made a lot of money, lost a lot of money, the usual entrepreneurial story. I even made a feature film, believe it or not, called The Killer Tongue, which lost me a pile of money. Uh, and uh, to give you an idea how bad this film was, the opening scene is a meteorite landing on Earth. It breaks open and a transvestite with four poodles emerges. It was a sort of schlock horror thing. But that, it, it, it was hopeless. You can still see it late night and about 3 a.m. in the morning in obscure channels. Anyway, but the, the, the company turned out to be very successful indeed, generated a lot of cash. And then I sold that in 2005. So I, I managed to achieve my goal, which was retiring when I was in my 40s, uh, you know, and then uh, did, did what people do when they get a bit of money, you know, like bummed around a bit, <laughs> traveled a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, but then I, then I came back and uh, invested in some companies as an angel investor. I went on the boards of some public sector organizations, won a big arts organization. I did that for 10 years. Uh, I also... Uh, uh, you know, really drove uh, some other companies that I was interested in. And they were successful and have been successful as well, all in the area of technology and learning. So those are the two words that have, have really haunted me uh, or, or, or excited me for the whole of my adult life. So I find myself here right now, and I'll just summarize by saying, that now I, I'm, I, on, my, on my biography, a, a chairman introduced me when I gave a talk once as being free from the tyranny of employment. <laughs> and that, that's true, but I, that's not strictly speaking true because I'm a director of certain companies. I have a company, an artificial intelligence company called Wildfire. Come to that later. I, I talk, I give talk, talks all over the world. You know, last year, you know, Australia, Moscow, Stanford, the, the Mayo Clinic uh, uh, in, in the U.S. I'll be off to Albania, Kurdistan, all sorts of places this year. So I do a lot of talks because I like traveling. Mm -hmm. I, I'm also a professor at the University of Derby, visiting professor there. So I have a sort of academic swing to my life. I, I'm just about to publish a book called AI for Learning, Artificial Intelligence for Learning. 
a board member of companies and so on. So I have a sort, you know, one of these things that's almost cliche portfolio career thing, but really I'm, I'm in the fortunate position of being able to do what I want and that's it really. Interestingly, when you, I, I just had a thought there. When you give your biography, you always give the peaks, don't you? Yes. I haven't given any of the troughs. <laughs> Believe me, everybody's got troughs, big troughs. And I've had plenty of those. I, I might have made some money, but I lost a lot of money. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I, I made, you know, people make mistakes. I've made, I've made plenty. That sounded, it sounded overly, overly, you know, like boastful what I've just said there. But believe me, there were lots of, lots of bad things happen along the way. Sure, exactly. <laughs> Tell us a little bit more, more about Wildfire. What, what is it? Who's it for? Why would they want it? Why should they explore further? Well, there was one very interesting phenomenon. I'd, I'd spent a lot of time commercially in the what's called the e-learning market and the content market. And uh, it, to be honest, I was, you know, it, it seemed to not change for about three decades. I, you know, for about 30 years, I'm, I'm saying 30 because it's more than that now, it's really became a sort of presentation game, you know, a media production game. It used to be called multimedia. It even got worse when you could deliver video and animation and so on. So you typically have a team with a graphic designer, a video person, and some audio engineers, and you have to keep them in employment almost. So what we get is this very glossy front-end stuff that pays far too little attention to the back end and how people actually learn in real life. So I was determined to make that, and first, and it's incredibly expensive, takes ages, and has very low retention. That Those two words, low retention, are really important for me. So I looked at this problem, you know, and said, listen, surely we could do something in this content area to make this, you know, when people want to learn something, it should be high retention. Surely that must be the first criteria. And it should be cheap and it should be quick. So I built a tool using AI techniques, artificial intelligence, that creates stuff in minutes, not months, uh, at about 10% of the cost. And I based it on, you know, some of the cognitive science that I really like around retrieval practice, cognitive effort, the sort of things that I've learned over the years uh, really have helped me learn, but more importantly, are objectively there as science. You know, this is not me talking. I'm saying that if you go into a really good cognitive science department, they will tell you X, Y, and Z, and that's how we should build our tools. Uh, so that's what I did. That's what wildfire is. You know, it's quick, it's cheap, with high retention. Thank you. Can you tell us a little bit about your exposure to what uh, I call HPT, Human Performance Technology, but it's really evidence-based practices for performance improvement through many different means. When did you first get exposed to evidence-based practices? Well, when we when I first, you know, when the, along with these two other guys, we started a business, I was immediately, I mean, I came from a very abstract academic world in a sense. And then I was launched into these big global companies. And I was, I, to be honest, I was really shocked. I was really shocked because I was in these meetings where people were talking about learning and learning styles. And I didn't know anything about this. So I went and I, I'm a sort of research bookish sort of person. I went back and thought, wow, this is real hokum. I don't think this stuff really is real. I was, I became a real skeptic really quickly. Uh, and then working in big companies, you sort of get to know the politics and the games that people are playing. And, I, you know, I, I'm not too critical of this because people are people, organizations are organi organizations, but things become institutionalized really quickly in large organizations. And this is not always a good thing. So that was my exposure. I, a lot of reading. I said, well, I don't know anything about this field. Let me do it. And I did a big deep dive and have all my life, really, and written a lot about this over many, many years. Uh, but the, if you're talking about performance support, very specifically there, actually, my first exposure was way back in the 90s. I met uh, Gloria, uh, uh, is it Gloria Gary. Gary. Uh, I think it was 1992 or something in Denver, of all places. And I remember it vividly. I was sitting on the front row of a conference. She was sitting next to me. I didn't know who she was. I thought, this woman this woman knows a thing or two. Seemed fresh. And the guy on the stage was Roger Shank. And I'd never met Roger before. And Roger blew my mind because he didn't give a toss what he said. I mean, he really attacked the audience. He attacked everybody in the room. There were gasps from people. You know, I thought, But then I was listening to what he was saying. I'm going, no, hold on. Get, put aside the attitude, which I liked anyway. This guy is talking sense as well. So I, I suddenly found myself with two people I'd never heard of. I went, wow, this this makes sense to me. 
Uh, that was the first time I, I met Roger, actually, and he's been a friend of mine for a long time. So that that was interesting. Beyond that, over the years, I always had this sort of, you know, well, this is right, you know, the learn by doing theory and so on, you know. Like, how do people actually learn? Well, they, first of all, they're not conscious of it being learning, you know, that we, we didn't evolve to, to, to learn in that sense. They're also, it's a complicated cognitive process. Uh, but beyond that, then Jay Cross, much later, I knew Jay really well, nice guy, a good friend of mine, came to stay with me here in England. Uh, I liked all that stuff on informal learning, uh, moving beyond that. And people think that all this learning in the workflow is new. <laughs> yes, I mean, do you go there? Are you kidding me? <laughs> like, I, you know, I'm now describing things that happened 30, 40 years ago. You know, this has been around for a long, long time. And in fact, if you go way back in the theory to people like John Locke and the Enlightenment, and so they talk about this all the time. There's a, you know, people don't do any reading in our field. That it disappoints me a little bit. But this theory is there is theory as well as practice. So all along, there's been this strain of thought. And the people, I, I was naturally drawn to those people because I think it matched empirical reality. Besides uh, Roger Shank and uh, Jay Cross, uh, are there other influences that you had from uh, readings and books and things like that, things that we can point other people to now? Yeah, well, I mean, I've, I've written a lot in this area, so I know... Uh, you know, I'm, I'm in the middle of a hundred pieces on a hundred learning theorists. Mm -hmm. I've got most of those written, but I polished them as I released them. And there are two periods I like in particular. One is the Enlightenment, because uh, we, we had in that period this break with the scholastic past, as it were, when people like, you know, Locke, uh, Wollstonecraft, women in education. Uh, we had a flourishing thought around how people actually learn. And then I like those early people like William James, Ebbinghaus and so on that introduced the psychology of learning into us. And then most of all, to jump to the present, there is a bunch of memory theorists and cognitive scientists. And I'm always pointing people towards their theory because it's, uh, it's good science. And uh, so whether it's, whether it's Sweller and cognitive load, uh, you know, you have to read that if you want to understand how a working memory actually co- it struggles in the real world in an organization to, to learn anything. Well, you know, in, in AI and ethics is a funny subject because it's mostly, for me, the theater of ethics. And I was people are getting offended by things they don't know much about. Uh, because AI, I, I have two lines I use when I give talks on this because I get the same questions about bias, racism, and all sorts of things in, in AI every time. Uh, and the line is that AI is not as good as you think it is. And I was like, it's really hard building this stuff. And the idea that there's a bunch of like white kids deliberately writing racist algorithms is far-fetched. <laughs> uh, and secondly, it's not as bad as you might fear. So if you have these abstract rules, and I hear them all the time, like a good example, you, see, you hear this in academia all the time, from very smart people on these, uh, on these ethics committees who say all algorithms must be wholly and utterly transparent. And then my retort is, well, you have to stop using Google, Google Scholar, all social media. You have to stop all that stuff right now because they're proprietary algorithms and you actually don't know. And they certainly are not going to tell you how they work because it's a commercial uh, advantage. And of course, nobody's going to give up Google Scholar and Google because they're in amazingly efficacious and drive research. Imagine not having Google Scholar. I remember doing research when I spent six months of my life wandering up and down library shelves with little little card indexes. Are we going to go back to that because you because the algorithm isn't transparent? I don't think so. So, and then the other things on race, like gender, is an interesting one as well, where people go, "Well, I have an Alexa right behind me." Yeah, it hasn't lit up. That's good. <laughs> and now, now, people say, well, Alexa, Cortana, uh, Google Assistant, and, and various other things are all female voices. And, say, well, and then the accusation is it's a patriarchal plot, which, of course, is nonsense, because in the book by Vlahos, which explains this in some detail, they did an immense amount of research for choosing the gender of the voice. And you can actually choose to switch gender on all of them apart from Alexa. And the bottom line is we as human beings have evolved to think that the female voice is better, more trustworthy, even in the womb. So, you know, people don't go back and look at the research, and they're quick to jump and make judgments and conclusions about things that are sometimes just not true, I think. 
And we just need to calm down. This is just another, it's just software, it's just tech, like anything else. We need to be careful around privacy, uh, human rights and actual harm. But uh, I think that this has turned into hysteria. There are three, 400 groups popped up. There's probably double that. Every university has one now. And it's mostly hot air, to be honest, uh, because the danger here, I feel, is that it stops beneficial things from happening. Uh, if we over-regulate, we'll put a break on the research and uh, some of the good things that will happen may not happen. Uh, let me give you a real example. In China, people in Europe, they're looking at banning face recognition, full stop. Now, in China, you have schools where when the kids come in at the moment, they get face recognized and automatically the register is taken. Now, in the school my sons went to, 20 minutes every morning, a teacher sat and took their names and wrote it down in a register. This is madness. What a waste of human time and effort. Now, imagine eliminating that globally. Imagine how much extra time we'd have to do whatever we have to do, learn, enjoy ourselves, play sport or whatever, just because we recognize that a machine can do the register in a, in a fraction of a second. Now, if we say we won't have face recognition in schools, even though that data is temporary and you can handle the privacy issues easily enough, we're just, we're cutting our own throats in many ways, you know, by being prematurely censorious about technology that may actually solve climate change, some of the big political issues around inequality and so on. So it, it annoys me, the theater of ethics. Yes, thank you. Thank you for that. Let me shift again. Is there a favorite performance improvement or evidence-based practice or learning term or phrase that you would like to define for us? Perhaps you feel it's being misused currently and you would like to put your spin on it. Uh, you've given us several already in this talk, but uh, is there anything in particular that uh, uh, you think perhaps is uh, something you'd like to tackle? Yeah, the, the one that causes me most concern, realist and real concern, is the word leader and leadership. Never in the history of our species have we been more disappointed with our leaders globally, whether that be in politics, business, sport, any area of human endeavor. We seem to have people who rise to the top who are venal, who don't seem to care, instrumental, and who... And never have we had less respect for our leaders than we have historically. And I think this comes down to something that happened way back in the day with those business books like The Good to the Great and, uh, and so on. Uh, uh, I was actually, I was actually uh, banned. A, I was blocked on Twitter by Tom Peters because I criticized his book in Search for Excellence. Can you believe that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but the word leadership annoys me because I think it should be banned from the training world. I mean, what? Who do we think we are? You know, most people, you know, what, what have we led? What do we lead? You know, workshops? <laughs> you know, like, where's this expertise coming from? So you say, well, where's the expertise coming from? And uh, Pfeffer, the professor at Stanford, wrote a brilliant book called, uh, called Leadership Bullshit. And the whole first couple of chapters is saying this is the problem in training. You know, this is the training world created this, puffed it up to make us look important, to give us a voice. But it's all wrong. You know, leadership is nothing like this. It's hopelessly idealistic. It doesn't match human nature in any way whatsoever. And it's almost a waste of time. It's not all a waste of time because it, actually what we did is just repackage management training and just put the word leader on it. As if, you know, as I said earlier, you know, as if Nigel in accounts is suddenly Genghis Khan, you know, and uh, you can create, change the world forever. This is such bullshit, this. And I think I'd like to ban that word, word and uh, its associated training. Thank you. Thank you. Let me do another shift here. Um, what I'm looking for at this point are some stories to humanize people that many in the audience may have heard about but didn't know personally. They may have seen them on videos. They may have read their books. But are there people in your network that you can uh, share some stories with us, whether they're funny stories or serious stories. Do you have anything for us? Uh, you know, you know, I, I only I only ever come up with these anecdotes when I've had two beers you know, like, <laughs> to get me started. You know, <laughs> but yeah, I've worked with a lot of really interesting people here and in the states and around the world. Uh, you know. The person I always go back to here, I don't have any your brute stories, is Roger Shank. I always enjoy hanging out with Roger because Roger Shank 
I've never seen anyone shock so many audiences globally in my life than Roger. And Roger, you know, was a mathematician, top maths at Yale, started a big company. He's, you know, this is a successful guy, smart guy who knows what he's talking about. This is a high-end researcher in cognitive science who's made real contributions to the field. I've seen Steven Pinker reference Roger in talks he's given, you know. And, and, and when Roger comes in and basically says, listen, you know what you're doing? What are you doing sending all these kids to college? What a waste of time. You know, something, he's sort of right. <laughs> and he's been right for decades. But, of course, he seems like an extremist when he's actually not. He's someone who just knows the science so well and can cut to the quick so well that nobody believes him. Because we have this orthodoxy around, the, you know, everybody should go to college for three, four years, you know, though they forget everything, even though it's about 80% signaling, just putting a big post-it on your head saying, hire me. All that money, you know, 1.4 trillion in the US, federal debt, just to give stickers on people's heads, is bizarre, you know. I was at Penn State uh, last year, I landed there, there was a football stadium, it took something like 150,000 people, they only play eight games a year there. You go, what on earth are we doing? That's not education. This is like the entertainment is, well, it's an industry, isn't it? You know, that's what it's turned into. So I think, you know, Roger, I, I just enjoy watching Roger talk because, you know, people's jaws drop in the audience. But they know, in their own hearts, they know he's sort of right. So, that, you know, that uh, that's one thing. Another guy I really enjoyed hanging out with in the area of performance support, which I know you're really interested in, is Jay Cross. And I knew Jay for years. And uh, whenever he came to Europe in Berlin and he stayed with me here in England, uh, I enjoyed him. You know what, what I really liked? I re remember, I went to study in the States when I was 19. And I liked the U.S. And I... I, I the, the one that I like, it's music uh, and so on. And and Jay was a bit of a sort of West Coast hippie guy, you know, from uh, San Francisco. And he always had that ethos, you know. Uh, and that's what I liked about him. He was always chilled out, always wore a sort of Hawaiian shirt. And he epitomized that sort of 60s type ethos to me. Terribly nice guy, very moral, wanted to do the right thing for people. And his informal learning theory was fantastic. But he was so laid back, I should add that he... He would indulge in other hippie-type activities that may be illegal in many countries. Funnily enough, he was probably right in that one since it suddenly become legal again. So I always enjoyed that side to him as well. But, you know, there are some really interesting people who are outliers, I would call them, outsiders. Roger Shank, Jay Cross. There's one, if there's one book I would recommend everybody to read, it's De-Schooling Society by Ivan Illich. That book is short. And it will change your life. It's not right. I don't agree with everything in it. But it's such a brilliantly written book, so incisive, that I guarantee it would change your views and things if you read it. So there's two people who are alive, one who's no longer with us. Well, two are no longer with us. Sorry, they, you know, as you know, uh, Jay, sadly, uh, yes. Uh, yes. has gone as well. Donald, thank you so much for participating in this video interview with me. Uh, as a... Uh, my final question is, can, can you, do you have any words of wisdom, guidance that you might provide to people who are new entering our field of learning? What would you, what's your, what's your guidance for them? One, don't believe what the group think tells you to believe. Because in this area, it's mostly faddish, you know, superficial theory and practice. And if you find yourself in a room in a round table with somebody with a flip chart who says, here's a question, all get together, discuss it, put it on, we'll pin it up on the wall, walk out. You're wasting your time. Uh, uh, you know, don't believe that this stuff works. Just be skeptical. Read a lot. You know, go back to the real source stuff and say, what, what does the science say about this? And always keep that skepticism in mind without being cynical. Uh, you know, most people are trying to do a good job. It's not that people are uh, have ill will in them. They just, we as a profession in the learning game, we don't take it seriously enough. We don't take learning seriously enough. So we present what is, you know, superficial entertainment a lot of the time. Theatre, presentation, talking at people, flip charts, bogus collaborative events, uh, 
you know, we would save ourselves a lot of time and bother if we just cut to the quick and treated people like adults and human beings and stopped introducing schooling into the workplace. Donald Clark, thank you so much for sharing the, the, your thoughts with us. I wish you a good day. Thank you, sir. No problem. That was fun. Thank you.